Buenos dias, everyone. Good morning. Sounds like you're enjoying San Jose. Maybe. All right. <laughs> um, it's good to see you all here. I am Dr. Liliana Castrellon. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Educational Leadership, and I co-coordinate the Higher Education Leadership Program. So reminder, y'all, I am a professor, I'm a profa, I ask long questions, <laughs> and I probe. So <laughs> uh, if you all need me to repeat anything, please do let me know. Um, so today we are going to talk a little bit about the K-16 pathways and infrastructure and how the digital landscape uh, works within that. So for the next 45 minutes or so, we will discuss the development of today and tomorrow's workforce by exploring how K-16 educational institutions, nonprofit institutions, and community organization government, industry, and the private sector inform and are informed by the digital landscape. We have two experts here to guide us and to chat with us a little bit. We have Albert Kahami, as well as Carrie moltzby Lute. Please give them a round of applause. And I will hand it over to them to introduce themselves. In your program, you do have their full bios. Uh, given the time constraints with only 45 minutes, I'm gonna go ahead and let them introduce themselves briefly, invite you all to check the program to see their full bios. And if you all could share with us who you are and one thing that you are proud of professionally and one thing you're proud of just as a human being. Good morning, everyone. My name is Albert Gahami. Uh, thank you for coming here at uh, 8 a.m. on a Friday. I work as the city of San Jose's privacy officer, which at the end of the day means that any technology, AI, uh, data that the city collects, it's my team's job to make sure that that data is used effectively, responsibly, and we are empowering not only our staff, but our residents to guide, inform, and use the latest technology that we're seeing today for their benefit. One of the things that I am most proud of professionally is something that we're doing right now with SJSU, actually. We have been putting together an upskilling program of taking our existing staff in the city and helping them learn both how to use data science, so think Excel, Tableau, data visualization tools, Python, integrate them into their own work so that they can tell better stories and make better decisions. And alongside that, build out their own AI assistants to better do their work. This has been a fantastic partnership and uh, we've been able to get curriculum development from SJSU. Uh, I have learned a lot about teaching, and I hope our students have learned a lot about building their own assistance and understanding data. Uh, and it's been a fantastic experience of taking folks uh, from no knowledge of Excel to telling stories with maps and analysis. One thing that I am proud of professionally is, or sorry, personally, is I have uh, managed, managed to find peace between myself and the cats that live at my house. <laughs> I, uh, I'm allergic to cats, but uh, one of my housemates, one of my, one of my family members is not, and so being able to find a common ground where we can love each other at a distance has been truly something something valuable, something important to understand in my own day-to-day -day life. Thank you. I love that. Way to, yeah, that's a great personal <laughs> accomplishment. Um, hello, everyone, and it's an honor to be here with you all. Thank you so much, Andrine, for the invitation, and New America, San Jose State University for the work that you're doing to host this really important conversation. My name is Carrie maltzby Lute, and I head up partnerships for Northeastern University's Oakland campus. Um, raise your hand if you're familiar with Northeastern University's Oakland campus. Nice, and we also have a Silicon Valley campus in San Jose. Um, raise your hand if you're familiar with that campus. 
All right, perfect. So um, Northeastern University is a network of campuses now, um, originating, you know, obviously from, from Boston in the Northeast, and now spanning United States, uh, Canada, United Kingdom, and in the Bay Area, we have obviously the, the Oakland campus and the San Jose campus that I just mentioned. And, uh, you know, our, our historic campus um, coming from the merger of Mills College. And I was a part of uh, Mills College uh, prior to this you know, historic merger, and I'm really excited to be heading up partnerships in support of the community and our students. And so my work centers around finding experiential learning opportunities for students and faculty research opportunities, and then also thinking about um, organizational upscaling and development. And so I'm just very honored uh, to continue to serve the community that I love. I've been in Oakland for over 25 years, and I'm um, just really excited about the opportunity that we now have to uh, continue to add value as this new entity. And uh, professional accomplishment, um, just experience, you know, I, I came from five years of being a professor of practice, teaching marketing, and um, within those years of work, I uh, led over 75 experiential learning projects where students worked with real organizations that were community-based um, nonprofits, small businesses, and helped them with various problems that they had. And to see that work come to life and the impact on the community, um, ran into a entrepreneur uh, just last year who uh, my students had worked with a few years ago. And you know, this person is still using the assets that the students created in that class to help drive their renewable energy nonprofit. And so it's, it's um, you know, that passion for experiential learning that fuels me and also fuels the work that we do at Northeastern University really centered around applied learning. Um, and personally, I don't know how I top a cat, <laughs> you know, like relationship, you know, the story there. Um, but I'll say, you know, when I reflected on this question, it's really about legacy. And I think about my grandmother uh, and my grandfather. And one was an educator and one was an entrepreneur. Um, they were both born in the early 1900s. Um, one had a third grade education, my grandfather, who was the son of sharecroppers, so just a generation outside of slavery. And all he did as a social entrepreneur in his com community, um, he was, you know, had successful businesses and then wound up um, supporting people and becoming homeowners at a time it was really challenging for African Americans to become homeowners because you know banking practices, and then my my grandmother who kicked off uh, the string of bachelorette you know and college degrees in our family. So I'm a third gen um, in part because of you know because of the legacy that she did. So you know I think students that are first gen that's such a powerful role to play. Um, so just really, you know, the work that San Jose State does, you know, especially serving so many first gens, it's a powerful legacy and it's something that I think about regularly. Thank you all for sharing. And just to interject, it is first gen week. So congratulations to all of us first gens in the, in the room. So let's start our panel by talking about a big picture, right? What we'll do is we'll start with a question for both and then we'll do individual questions and then come back around to a question for both panelists. This first question is gonna bring us to talk about that K-16 infrastructure. Overwhelmingly, we know that educational institutions across K-16, so across elementary through high school and higher education, have been negotiating how to incorporate AI and other digital technologies into their curriculum and standards. What recommendations do you have for schools and higher education institutions about how AI and technology can be used? And how does this look different across schools and higher education institutions? <laughs> you want me to go? I'll go first this time. How's it? <laughs> so um, I'll start kind of high level. Um, and you do have some meaty, amazing questions, by the way. <laughs> so I kind of broke this up. Uh, you know, on the teacher side, I, I think it begins with the teachers because it begins with the culture. And uh, it's, I would say that teachers and faculty and staff of institutions, really, you know, K through 16 throughout, you know, the entire uh, realm have to really embrace 
the idea of being a scientist, a mad scientist, and embrace AI and tinkering and working in AI every day. Um, so I think it really begins with the cultural shift and not fearing, you know, the, the tool, um, like, like so many people, you know, have. And uh, there's just some amazing applications of, uh, you know, use that teachers can bring to the classroom, you know, such as Opus Clips, which is a tool that enables um, you to take long form video and make really short viral snippets of things. And so it's, if, you know, you can imagine teachers uh, recording lessons and then creating short snippets of their content, you know, and make it, you know, fun and, and use it in a way that uh, is engaging to the students. And also thinking about uh, on the, the teacher faculty side, folks that work with student support services, you know, specifically the fact that there are, you know, there's research that shows anywhere between 20, 10 to 30% of students have some, are, are neurodivergent. And so thinking about how technologies uh, can support with a better classroom experience, um, technologies like Slack and other tools that will enable for less less chatter. You can get you know synopsis of notes and things like that. Um, and then on you know the student side, uh, I would say that foundational skills are still key. That's still so important. So just gradually implementing AI technologies. Uh, the, the other day it was pretty funny. My nine-year-old son was doing his homework and he was doing long division and uh, start, asked Alexa for the answer to his question. And so we had to tell him, hey, you, you know, you do the work first, and then you can, you know, use Alexa to, you know, so it's about teaching ethics um, along the way. Um, they're also in, my two children are in a French immersion school, and we have, you know, been using Duolingo as a way to supplement some of the learning. So I think AI is showing up in our life, you know? So I just think that, you know, kind of leaning into that. Um, I can speak more to the higher, higher ed side because that's, you know, really where I spend most of my time. And, um, you know, some of the interesting things that we're doing surrounding supporting AI integration is with, uh, we have a program out of Boston called AI for Impact. And that's a co-op program that's designed and fund, funded with the Commonwealth Massachusetts and it enables students to have six month internships with governmental entities. And so, and this is in support of challenges and, and opportunities that community members are going through. So they're designing uh, solutions with the community surrounding AI. And so that's just an example on the higher ed side of how we're integrating AI and learning and the student experience. Uh, and I would just say, you know, having taught for years, like what are the ways that students, you know, that teachers can continuously integrate different activities in the class that are ex they're exposing students to different AI applications. Um, and the last example I'll give is we're working on a drop-in AI clinic on the o Oakland campus. So uh, small businesses can come on Saturdays and get support from students that are trained in generative AI. So just how do we continuously think about leveraging the student learning experience to connect that with community support? So that's just some of the ways that we're doing it, always thinking about you know, how we can connect community with student learning through AI. Maybe I should have gone first. I don't know how I'm supposed to follow <laughs> that up. <laughs> but Carrie, I, I, I appreciate hearing so much of that from the educator perspective, trying to figure out how do we get the students, the, both the students and the faculty, fluent in this stuff. And let's, let's make very clear, right? I am, I am not a teacher. I am a bureaucrat, right? I work for the city of San Jose. I love my work. Um, but what I can speak to, and maybe maybe some of the some of the stuff that can hopefully complement what what Carrie just shared, is what we're seeing in the community and how that's been reflected in how we're seeing things change in our culture. The city of San Jose, we do some engagement in uh, you know with our students, uh, elementary school, uh, the Tech Interactive Museum, which if you haven't been to, it's right down the street. Over there, I think. Um, fantastic place. Kids love it. It's a great place to learn. I love it. And we had a session where we uh, a bunch of students came in, mostly elementary, middle school, 
sat down and we, we just showed them how to use ChatGPT. We showed them how to play with these tools. And, and two things really stuck out with me. One was two kids giddily playing and typing on ChatGPT for about half an hour trying to design their own Pokemon. And just this explosion of creativity and exploring different ideas and concepts. And we're not, we're, I mean, we're talking into numbers, statistics, thinking about how these Pokemon would play out. All of that sort of just creative juices and flowing out collaboration across two different people working on this together was made possible because they were able to play along with this new tool in front of them. And then another little tidbit that I saw that day was a student coming in, must have been maybe fifth grade, uh, did not speak English at, at this time, uh, came up, the chaperone said, you know, they don't speak English, they, they only speak uh, a certain Chinese. And what we were able to do is, I was able to say, ChatGPT, please provide these uh, instructions on how to use you and how to play with you in Chinese, go. I turn it around to the kid, and it shows him, shows him what to do, and the kid starts, you know, he starts typing, he starts having fun, he starts exploring things. And all of a sudden, the kid is the kid is smiling. He's dancing. He's he's playing around with this tool and exploring it in a way that just I really hadn't seen before. I have to imagine that it's the same feeling of of that first Google search or that first ability to access a type of information that you just hadn't before. And I bring those up because I think those moments of discovery and creativity are a new window that we can really open up through these tools. And it's something that can go across language, it's something that can go across levels of expertise. My main concern is how do we make sure that everyone has access to these tools? We can, we can talk more about that, I think, uh, in some of the later questions, but that, that ability for us to learn and grow together. So if I can, if I can just, summarize that I, I, don't, I don't think this is something that is entirely new for us, right? I think the concerns around is this going to change how we're, how we're teaching or how we're expecting students to fill out their assignments? Yeah, probably. I mean, but before this was Spark Notes, before that was Cliff Notes, before that, it, we have been through this rigmarole before, things will adapt. What I think is important is that we are able to learn fast grow together, and make sure that our teaching staff is equipped to match our students and help our students grow in this rapidly evolving space. Beautiful. What I want to point out from the both of you in your conversation is that although we have the perspective of an educator and a self-proclaimed bureaucrat, both of y'all were able to talk about the impact of these tools with students, right? And I think when it comes to technology, we have to think about how change in education isn't just gonna happen within education. We need to connect to these various systems, right, which is what this panel is about. We need to connect with community organizations, with government institutions, right, to be able to provide that access, but also the different, for, for folks to learn the different tools that are available. So with that, leading us into this next question, which is focused on access, we know that school districts are funded in varying ways and that school districts that serve lower socioeconomic communities, as well as predominantly students of color, are often underfunded and under-resourced. How would you all recommend educators in these schools to supplement access to technology? And how might higher education institutions serve students who are coming in with technology gaps in their experiences? I can start on this one. Um, it, look, again, this question of access, while it has a new face and it is still a fundamental issue that we've been working on 
for decades, right? The digital divide is nothing new. Making sure that people have access to technology is nothing new, right? At the end of the day, if I'm going to use ChatGPT or if I'm going to use uh, Google Gemini or any of these tools, what do I need? I need good internet and I need access to a computer or at the least a phone with internet, right? Those questions have been things that we've been trying to solve for decades. One of the things that I'm really proud about with City of San Jose is that we have been able to partner with our lower income school districts, Eastside Union, to be able to build out that Wi-Fi infrastructure. And I think this goes back to the idea that we cannot do this in a vacuum. This takes not just our educators being able to provide better knowledge around these tools, but also our cities and our governments providing the infrastructure to make that possible, right? It is because of the city that students across the east side have reliable, fast Wi-Fi on all of their campuses. But that has to be paired then with making sure that they also have physical devices, right? And that's why I'm really proud of what our library does um, in partnership with the university, in partnership with our school districts in providing laptops and other technical equipment that students can use to be able to access these tools, right? We are at a point where if I have internet access, I can get access to basically a second brain. And if I can pay 20 bucks a month to get a premium membership for one of these tools, I can get access to a better brain. And what does that mean then for the people that do not have access to that better brain? And I think this just goes back to the fact that we need to find ways to provide this extra layer of support to our students, whether it be through ensuring digital access, ensuring fast internet, and ensuring, if possible, some of these premium memberships, being able to find ways to provide access to our students to use these tools at the lower levels, and as we're thinking about college beyond, how do we start getting people comfortable with these tools, right? I can't speak to the university side, but I can speak to teaching other lovely self-proclaimed bureaucrats that teaching them has been truly an exercise in just getting people's feet wet. I, 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 cannot, I cannot stress enough on how we have seen our staff light up by being able to just get comfortable enough to just try it out and show them different ways to try it out. And we've been learning, uh, us as the instructional staff teaching this class to our, uh, to our city staff, just different ways to engage, whether it be talking to ChatGBT via voice, or it's uploading pictures, or testing out different things, right? That, trying to ignite that level of experimentation has, in my opinion, been one of the most fundamental things. And especially in the ways where we're trying to play catch up is really one of the most important ways where folks can then start to learn on their own on how these tools work. Nice. I really appreciate that you talked about, you know, just the premium memberships and the different issues and gaps in accessibility. And I think that that's something that hopefully some of these companies that are providing these tools can start, you know, supporting and covering and subsidizing. Um, I would say when we talk about just that gap between funds and budget constraints that so many schools have, you know, we're all budget constrained. Even institutions that feel like, you know, we should have a lot of resources, there's always constraints. And so that's, you know, why radical collaboration and these radical partnerships that don't make sense, but they actually do because we have to leverage the resources that different entities have to, to be able to do more. And so, uh, some of the things that we've done has been partnering with tech companies. I would advise schools and institutions to, um, again, go to the companies that have some of the funds. Uh, I'm really proud about the partnership that we've had with HubSpot. Um, they are mar marketing automation software, and they have provided software. They've provided mentorship through some of their employees coming to our class. And so they have a whole program for edu um, dedicated educators and professors and classroom teachers. And so I think connecting with those mission aligned tech companies that can also you know, support with the learning is something that I would you know, recommend to these educators that are looking to fill the gap. 
Uh, and then I'd also say that partnering with district leaders, we're wor working very closely with Oakland Unified School District that is doing wonderful work around linked learning and having career pathways for their students. And so working with uh, our, our superintendent of linked learning, they're developing the partnerships mm -hmm. with, with tech companies and other companies that can then support in filling this accessibility gap. So those are you know, some of the ways that we are thinking about those partnerships that make sense to bring more resources to the class. Um, and then as far as uh, underprepared college entrance. Um, you know, summer bridge programming is something that we do and we do very well. We have a bridge to calculus program. We have our Mills Institute trailblazer program that's designed for first gen Pell eligible students and so to help them feel a sense of belonging in the class. And so we're really looking to always create belonging on the campus. And so some of the ways that we do that is through this intentional bridge program programmatic work. Um, and then we also have, I think it's pretty interesting, on the Boston campus, a virtual math question sensor that enables students to just do drop-in, um, you know, to connect with a mentor and do drop-in, uh, you know, counseling if they have a question about math. And so just really thinking about what are the needs that, that students have and what are the ways that we can help fill those gaps through different dynamic programming. Awesome. Thank you. Were you going to Carrie, I just, uh, uh, both, both like a thought and a question, because I think this is a really interesting spot here. When we're thinking about um, the, like the bridge program or a summer bridge program, being able to get people skilled, how do we, I'm trying to wrap my head around how do we get the person to then teach the thing to then make the bridge, right? And, and this is something that I've been thinking about is, one, one of the ways that we are trying to partner with some of the big players and think about that is getting them to just teach our teachers. And um, I'm curious if that's been uh, just, just something on, on your end, like how do, you, how do you reconcile that? I mean, I think it's always the goal, right? Yeah. Um, is like the goal is how do we, uh, empower students to, to, to become the trainers. And yeah. so we also do that through pilots, like uh, um, the AI workshop that we did for small businesses recently. Um, that was a, a sponsorship with Kapoor Foundation. Block, formerly Square, was also a sponsor of that. And we provided topical workshops to small businesses in the Oakland area. And it was very successful. And it was pretty, um, tangible and something that we could imagine students who are using generative AI to be able to easily um, lead. And so the goal is that these drop-in clinics that I spoke about earlier will be student-led. And it, you know, within a few weeks, we can train students to then pr provide training to businesses in the community. So I think with the bridge programming example, um, that's, that's the goal, um, is to have students who've gone through the programming come back their third or fourth year and act as um, mentors or, or trainers within that. But I think we should absolutely always be thinking about closing that circle. I think that also really speaks to civic engagement, right? And how we can use these spaces to civically engage our students in developing and creating some type of change. Um, so I'm going to skip the next question that you all have down just for purposes of time and jump into our first question for Albert and then we'll jump into our first question for Carrie. Um, so Albert, you mentioned a lot about working in government institutions, right, and you, work, you talked about uh, bureaucracy, et cetera. I want to know a little bit about your role in GovAI, but also how you would define in your own words this notion of responsible AI, accountability, and ethics in technology. Happily. So I think, I think at this very moment, some folks might be feeling a certain way about government uh, but one thing that does give me hope, that does give me excitement, is truly the, the champions and the, ex the, the willingness that I see the people working day to day in government, not, not just the, the, the elected officials, but the people on the ground providing services, how fired up they are 
to find ways to use the latest and greatest tools to provide better services. And I see this across the city of San Jose, and I see this across cities, counties, states across the country. Um, Lillian, Liliana brought up the GovAI Coalition, which is a coalition of over 500 government agencies across the country, started right here in the city of San Jose with partners ranging from San Antonio, Colorado, St. Paul, Minnesota, and many others across the country, across party lines, being able to try and tackle these tools together. One of the things that we learned is that while the technology is moving very fast, and it is, it's moving fast uniformly. And what I mean by that is the same chat GPT that I'm using right here in San Jose is the same exact chat GPT that someone is using in Nederland, Colorado, small town of a thousand people, right? If Nederland learns something about that tool or about some other element of AI or emerging technology, they can tell me about it, and now I don't have to make the same mistake, or if they found something valuable, now all of a sudden we can all use it, right? And one of the things that we've been able to do is through a coalition of hundreds of agencies is solve problems faster together, right? We were able, the city of San Jose and other agencies were able to churn out an AI governance policy from, from start to finish in four months. And the ability to just get that alongside a governance program and a structure behind that and educational tools to help upskill our staff all of that together was made possible because many hands make light work. And the GovAI Coalition, which I wanna make clear, is a partnership across universities. SJSU has been working with us right alongside us since the beginning, which was roughly a year ago. Um, it's a partnership with industry, it's a partnership with all of our public sector coming together on this. We were able to have San Antonio and Colorado be able to figure out a policy. We were able to have some folks in Oregon figure out for us a vendor agreement. And I can get more into that later, but I think so much of this is about ensuring vendor accountability so that then I, as a public servant, can be accountable to my residents. You know? And, and I, I can touch more on that in a bit, but that's that's really where, if, if I could have one thing that folks walk away from what, what at least I'm saying up here, is that that level of collaboration, because it's the same tools across the country, is possible. And we can move fast and each learn a little bit that it contributes to everyone's whole. And I encourage you, take a look at the GovAI Coalition, come join us. We have meetings basically two or three a week, depending on what you want to talk about. And that access to other people across the country and learning that material is something that we found incredibly valuable in moving fast and being able to keep up with the technology. Awesome, thank you. Carrie, I'm curious, how do you envision community organizations, nonprofit institutions, local businesses partnering with institutions of education across PK-16 to build robust opportunities for learning and innovation. I love this, because um, it's all about, once again, these kind of radical collaborations, and uh, so important to you know, solving the biggest problems that we have is, is really connecting across uh, the ecosystem um, and recognizing that we all need to come together. And so some of the examples that I'd like to talk about is um, one nonprofit called Game Heads. I'm not sure, raise your hand if you've ever heard of the nonprofit Game Heads. Uh, they provide, um, it's unfortunate, but um, maybe you all could Google them afterwards. They're doing amazing work in creating access uh, for underrepresented students. Uh, age, I believe, 15 to 24, uh, with the goal of getting underserved students into careers in technology. And they do that through game design and development because who doesn't want to, you know, who, everyone loves to play video games. Our young people love those. So that's the entry point that they use. And we've partnered with them. They've hosted students of ours. We've taken our students to visit 
the space that they work at, you know, that they play games in and they develop their classroom. And then our Northeastern students have actually engaged in the program. So they've applied to Game Heads. So they've gone through that experience. Game Heads has come and they've hosted their 10th annual conference on our campus. And now we're co-designing and developing curriculum around game design and development in collaboration with this nonprofit. This nonprofit is funded by Sony, Unity, EA. So it's, it's you know, really taking this larger ecosystem of corporations, nonprofits, government working together to have, to strengthen the pathway into technology for so many of our young people who don't have the access. So that's one partnership that I'm particularly proud of because of the, the circular impact that it has. Um, and I'll just, yeah, I think for time, maybe mm -hmm. leave it there. Yes, I've been wanting to probe so much on both of you all and everything you've been saying, but we have 10 minutes. So I'm gonna ask this one more big question, um, which is really gonna get us to think about where we're headed in the future and what types of changes need to make policy-wise. So we know that policy is made at a far remove from those they govern. In other words, policy or people who make policy are often not affected by the policy changes they are pushing for and often have no experience in the field they are making policy for. Given your expertise, what are two to three of the most dire needs for policymakers to address and what strategies should be used to address these? I feel like the policy guy should probably start. <laughs> you guys can hear from him. My pleasure. If, so, okay. If there are two things that I can have folks walk away when we're thinking about policy, one, we need to have our leaders try these tools. They need to actually be able to use and understand what they govern. And two, and this goes, I think, Carrie, to what you're talking about uh, with game heads, which sounds super cool, by the way. Um, is how do we then bridge the gap from our policy makers to the people that are impacted so that we can make this stuff approachable. Mm -hmm. One of the things that the city of San Jose has been doing over the last couple of years is figuring out how to engage our community on the technology that we are using across the city. And how do we make this stuff approachable so that we actually can get input from the community to guide and inform how the city is making policy. So much of that is around how do we make these tools and this conversation feel approachable. I'll just briefly say one of the things that we have seen is in communicating with our residents around all of the different technology, the data that the city collects, whether it be a camera that you see at a traffic stop or the new ideas of chat GPT and AI and all that, what we have found is that when we engage our residents, when we break it down into simple things, when we understand where they're coming from, and we actually share and explain what we're trying to do with them, we get a collaborative shift. We go from why are you putting this camera up and risk people shooting it down, to, to I understand why you're putting this up, here is where I want you to put it up because that intersection is where people take a right turn like a maniac and my kids walk to school and I want them to feel safer. And it's that connection that we see at the local level, paired with the connection between the local governments and the state. And we've been able to, we've been fortunate enough to talk with the state of California and other states across the coalition to then tr bring up that voice that we're hearing from the community to actually start informing and guiding the policy from the grassroots level. And I think when you merge that with some of the tech literacy that we are working on through the coalition to make sure that everyone understands what this technology is and keep up to date on it, you start building a recipe for something that can really create sophisticated, modern, up-to-date policies that can adapt to the changes that we're seeing. Nice, the power of co-creation, right? Really getting the community invested in the solutions. Um, I would say one of the things that's been on my mind uh, around AI since the revolution kind of took off is just the 
potential need for universal basic income, you know, that's like never, you know, that's, that's something that I've wondered with the market disruptions. We don't have, that's a whole nother panel conversation, but just it's also something to think about, you know, and, and I think the, the bill that uh, two senators, LaFonza Butler, now, now I think it's, they've been replaced, but um, there was a bill, Workforce for the Future, that was legislation trying to be passed surrounding studying the impact of AIs on the job market. So I think that uh, legislation and research and investing in research to really understand what's the impact of, of AI on the job market and how uh, we can then fund for education uh, initiatives around AI for schools, for teachers, for students. Um, we can make those greater investments when we really truly understand. Um, and I'll say one last thing, just on the policy side, that I'm actually really proud of something that we do. We have what's called a summer youth employment program. Uh, this, this work stems out of Boston, where 150 uh, Boston Unified students uh, wind up working at Northeastern University in departments all across the university. And this is a six week program that's funded, that has been funded by the state of Massachusetts. And Biden has actually talked about um, some of the research that showed through this funding decreases in crime, um, increases in graduation rates, all the things that we know to be true when young people are engaged in summer employment. And so we've actually brought this program to Oakland. And so we're get, we've served over 30 students um, for the last two years. And I had two high school students that worked on my team. And it was a six week experience. Fridays are dedicated to college preparation. And so if we can get more funding um, surrounding uh, summer youth employment, especially for our most uh, underserved children so they can feel a sense of belonging on the campus as well as uh, getting paid for work that is is they can add to their resume so I would say these are some of the things that I'm really excited about is you know the summer youth employment program and how policy wise we can do more to fund that yep. awesome thank you in these last three minutes there is a lot that we did not get to talk about today what are some final thoughts you want to leave the group with? I know you all prepared quite a bit for this. I send lots of questions. So I'm sure there's plenty on your mind. But what are anything uh, thoughts that you want to share um, in general that you want to make sure folks leave with today? Just find ways to plug into the community that is working on these problems. I, I cannot stress enough on how San Jose has been fortunate enough to be a part of the GovAI coalition to be able to learn fast across the board, from state agencies to universities to cities to federal agencies, we've been able to evolve and adapt and find ways to plug into those communities that speak your language and help you get up to speed as well. Um, I would say just really lean into AI. You should be using it every day. Um, play, we heard a lot about experimentation, just Again, have fun with it. We, no one is an expert in this space. We're all learning, we're all tinkering. It doesn't even know what it does, you know? So I would uh, just, um, and then at the same time, I would just say, you know, we have to be thoughtful and push for understanding the impacts of AI. Um, so I'll just leave it at that. Thank you all so much. I love how, all of us are coming from different areas, yet there's this beautiful conversation happening about how we can't be in our siloed areas anymore. We have to work together. We have to push for change in order to really provide access and to continue being innovative because, as you mentioned, things keep changing with technology, right? It keeps moving forward. It doesn't even know on its own what it can do. So thank you all for your thoughts. And with that, I believe we are closed. I don't know if we have time for questions or if we move forward. Um, we don't have time for questions, so sorry. Sorry, everyone. We do not have time for questions. Thank you.